Okay, thank you. Um, all right, opening, opening closed captions. Um, we, we will set the scene here with an email that went out to the EMEA listserv in 2007. Uh, does anyone have any suggested methods for decoding the closed caption information off of digitized video, preferably in a way that keeps the relationship between the captions and the time code? For those reading the who can't read the signature, this was written by David Rice, archivist at Democracy Now. Uh, Dave did not get a lot of responses to his email in 2007, but his question was a good one. Um, captions, just to start with a definition, are transcriptions of dialogue and other audio cues that are displayed over the image of an audiovisual program. Uh, captions are first and foremost a form of access for deaf people and others with hearing impairments. Um, captions were not part of the NTSC signal when it was standardized, so they had to be retroactively engineered into broadcast television. Um, these are the first American captions ever broadcast by WGBH in 1972 on an episode of The French Chef. These first captions were open, that is, they were burned into the image. Um, closed captions, which we'll be talking about, are not part of the image and can be turned on or off by the viewer. Today, extracting captions from the analog signal and turning them into digital text has a wide range of applications. Uh, accessibility is still primary. Extracted captions can be turned into streaming captions for the web. But extracted captions also let us do full text search of television programs, or they can make cataloging easier, or a wide range of other uses. Um, if we're able to extract captions, we can build upon decades of labor that often goes unnoticed because it's un invisible by default. So where will you find these captions? First off, you will need to have broadcast material or home media from North America. The caption standard we'll be talking about is called EIA or CEA 608. It's also known as Line 21, and it's supported in both analog NTSC and digital ATSC broadcast standards. So this presentation is going to be less relevant to collections with mostly European materials, for which I apologize, as we are currently in Europe, of course. Um, but if you do have American media in your collection, You'll start finding closed captions in broadcasts beginning in 1980, with some big jumps in the amount of closed captioning content after a series of legislation in the 90s. The Television Decoder Circuitry Act of 1990 required um, new televisions 13 inches or larger to have built-in uh, ability to decode captions, and the Telecommunications Act of 1996 mandated closed captioning for almost all English and Spanish television programming, at which point um, captions became the default for almost everything on television. Now we're also meeting requirements for closed caption on streaming media, um, but those are born digital. Um, just as an aside, also caption adoption did not happen on its own. Initially, captions could not be displayed on typical televisions without a separate caption decoder. Um, this is the 1980 series catalog, and you may not be able to read it, but um, a decoder here retails for $249.96, which in today's money is about $769. So this cost barrier meant that 10 years after closed captions were first broadcast, it was estimated that still only about 2% of deaf and hearing impaired people in the United States could access these captions. This low rate of accessibility was perceived as low demand by networks who then justified less captioning until it was mandated by legislation. I'm just saying all this to say, figuring out how to extract closed captions is not just saving us time and duplicated effort, but it's also honoring a sustained advocacy that gave us captions. People had to fight for closed captioning at every step of the way from foundational questions like how to add them to an already standardized broadcast signal to passing sweeping legislation in the 90s. So the difficult work, to, so to speak, of implementing captions has already been done. We just have to figure out how to extract them. But how do, how do we do that? Um, closed captions in the NTSC signal are transmitted as part of the vertical blanking interval. You can see them in the red line in the cyan portion of the image. Um, that is, they're contained within lines of video that you don't usually see on a television. So the vertical blanking interval was already used to transmit other metadata, such as time code, but engineers were able to find space on line 21 of each field right before the start of the visible image. Each frame of video has two fields, which means that two separate sets of captions are transmitted. For example, in the US, it's usually field one uh, stores English captions and field two Spanish. <clears throat> 
Here is a GIF if you prefer seeing your caption data in action. We can actually see the caption data blinking at the very top of the frame on the left in a red circle um, right above the video image. You can also see this on a television if you adjust the vertical hold. It's right above the image. So each field of caption data can transmit two bytes at a time, and those are at the end of the blue arrows flashing by as individual byte pairs. Um, they're, hexa they're hexadecimal characters. Caption data can be extracted straight to a formatted text file. Um, SCC, one of the simplest digital caption for file formats, just records the raw caption hexadecimal alongside time codes. Other caption formats use a translation matrix to turn the hex into simple human readable captions, such as in the SRT and WebVTT formats. Um, time text markup language is an example of a more heavily structured format used primarily in broadcast production environments. Um, each of these caption formats can be used for digital delivery. They are all compatible with each other, and many streaming services accept any of these caption formats, though SRT is, or, sorry, SCC is often the recommendation. There are a number of methods of extracting the caption data from the analog signal, but the one we will be focusing on today is FFmpeg's filter to extract EIA 608, or line 21 captions. This was authored by Paul B. Mahal in 2017. Um, it scans, this filter scans the field for EIA 608 data and associates it with time code, and I'm not qualified to talk about it much beyond that, um, but I am qualified to say thank you, Paul, for making this filter. Um, so now we know where to find the captions in the signal. We have an open source way to extract them, and we know what we want them to look like once they are extracted. So all it takes is a script. And this script is SCCU, which is now available on GitHub. It was written this year by Dave Rice using Paul Mahal's filter. It can locate closed caption data in your files and translate it into SCC and SRT captions. And to talk much more about it, the always delightful Ben Turkis. Sorry, everyone. Thanks, Annie. Uh, thanks for that great overview of the history of closed captions, uh, for breaking down the different standards that are at play here, and for introducing the topic of how to handle and hopefully uh, how to extract and make accessible captions during or after the digitization process. For those of you who were here last year, or for those who watched on the live stream, hello out there. Uh, what I'll be speaking about over the next 10 minutes or so will be very much an extension of, or possibly a corollary to, the talk that I gave last year about time code and new open source methods that have been devised to aid in the capture and retention of this important but often overlooked part of the video signal. So yes, this will be a natural extension of themes brought up in conferences past in a number of ways. I'll be living in the vertical blanking interval, Woohoo, it's a great place to be. Come join me here. Uh, there's so much wonderful stuff there. Uh, I'll, be talking, I'll be telling a story of open source sponsorship in action, and I'll be presenting a free and open solution that builds on FFmpeg and stands in opposition to expensive and proprietary alternatives. To be honest with you, in preparing for today, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to say. It's been, and I don't know how else to say it, a particularly messed up year in the United States, and sometimes it can be hard to maintain your enthusiasm for this niche work uh, when you see everything that's happening all around you. Um, but as burnt out and as exhausted as I was feeling last week, the prospect of being here with all of you um, and talking about this specific topic, accessibility, both accessibility for our collections and the accessibility of our tools, uh, it got me excited. It got me to a, a place where I was ready to talk about this long simmering but finely materialized new approach, which could not have happened without the hard work of people in this room who had the vision and foresight to see how generative the blending of the different communities gathered here today truly could be. I believe that we firmly entered the era in which the open source approach to AV archiving, and by this I mean the tools, the standardization work, and the overarching spirit and ethos, has reached or realized a kind of virtuous circle potential. There's a reinforcing quality to the advances that have been made over recent years, and there's a reinforcing quality to this community of people who are committed to helping one another, learning from one another, and breaking down the barriers, financial or structural or otherwise, that have allowed some collections to be well cared for while others are left ignored or maltreated. Closed captions are, in this way, perfectly illustrative or instructive. 
They are at their core an expression of a simple right of media participation that was long denied. Many of us, the archivists here, take closed captioning for granted. And in doing so, we potentially make more work for ourselves down the road. But even more troubling, we reinforce the kinds of exclusion and disregard that made this such a fraught battlefield to begin with. What I'm saying is that our failures in this realm are indicative of our failures as a whole when it comes to inclusion and inclusive thinking. We need to more actively seize upon areas of accessibility and insist upon their importance from the start, not as an afterthought. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, my collections predominantly do not contain videotapes from the world of broadcast, aka they don't include closed captions, and the ones that do aren't priorities for us as an institution, or if you're thinking, well, we're capturing the entirety of the video signal, vertical blanking interval and all, so this is a problem that can be dealt with at a future date, I guess I would argue that to me, this kind of thinking is in fact part of the problem, or if not the problem, emblematic of it. Now I recognize that we're talking about an absurdly small percentage of tapes, and I recognize that there's something absurd about raising such an Americentric topic at a European conference, but for me it's simply not enough to say, we've gotten this all figured out for ourselves. If you spent thousands on a proprietary solution, or if you're offloading this work onto a vendor, Congrats, I guess, uh, but that money could have gone to support and sponsor a sustainable solution available to us all. In closed captioning, uh, subtitling stenography and the digital convergence of text with television, Gregory Downey describes captions as suffering from a visibility paradox. And this, I think, is a useful formulation for us, one that can help inform what I consider to be the general or pervasive disregard for captions in our field. The very design of captioned text to be closed instead of open, Downey writes, to be ever present in the broadcast signal, but invisible on screen. This, he tells us, hides the very real human labor that was often performed by women that was at the core of this socio-technical system. While the focus of Downey's attention is certainly not the same as our own, we can easily trace the points of connection between this visibility, visibility paradox and our own lack of prioritization of closed captioning. Out of sight, out of mind, if you will. Uh, so let me now awkwardly attempt to get down from off of my high horse and tell you what exactly we've been up to over the past year. At the New York Public Library, we consider our use of open source tools as growing naturally out of who we are. For us, the ways of sharing knowledge and building community that are represented by the open source software movement uh, are tied directly to our wider efforts to promote and provide sustainable access to information. Uh, sorry. Over the past few years, we've sponsored a number of open source projects. We supported the addition of timecode to vRecord. We supported the addition of losslessness and integrity checking to raw cooked with Genevieve just described. And soon I hope to partner with the Smithsonian to see enhancements made to QC tools, which in many ways is the software that was at the start of it all for so many of us. And I could and have spoken at length about strategies for working within institutional contexts to advocate for open source projects, but I think the lesson in this particular sponsorship effort is leave no stone unturned. And how is this exactly? Because the money for SCCU came from what's called the Innovation Project, an internal grant program that NYPL offers to all of its staff members annually. And the grant provides an opportunity for people to dream up cool and forward-thinking projects, and the resulting efforts have always varied in really fun and diverse ways. So last year, for example, the Innovation Project sponsored a seed lending library, uh, a series of pop-ups and literacy events geared toward New York City public housing residents, and the 3D printing of some of the library's most prized treasures, things like E.E. E. Cummings' hand. It was creepy, actually, but. Um, there's a whole other story about navigating the bureaucratic waters, things like having to explain to stakeholders in IT, procurement, and legal that, no, we can't exactly claim copyright on an open source project that we're building upon. Uh, but I'd rather talk to you about the work that Dave did, the work that it leverages, and our experience in testing and deployment. So what is SCCU, where can you find it, how can you use it, and how does it work? Uh, let's start with the easiest piece of this. As Annie mentioned, the project lives on the Association of Moving Image Archivists GitHub. Uh, once you get there, you can find our README, where we put usage instructions that we tried to make as user-friendly as possible. SCCU is a relatively simple, depending on one's perspective, bash script that automates the process of using FFmpeg, and specifically FFprobe in the read EIA 608 filter, to scan the topmost portion of the video signal for closed captions, and if present, then translate that information into SCC and optionally SRT files. Um, Annie described a little bit, but I guess the difference between the two, the main difference is that SCC represents the captions as hex, SRT gets translated in and more human readable. 
What's nice about SCCU is that maybe for better, maybe for worse, it removes some of the challenge of using the read EIA 608 filter, and it gives you just the goods. So in essence, it performs a series of tests and operations. First, it probes a portion of your video for the presence of captions, and it does this in a few different ways, as captions were rarely perfectly consistent. So here you can see one test uh, in which SCCU uses different common values uh, to detect closed caption sync code markers. Uh, if it finds captions on a particular line of video, it then processes that video through FFprobe and read EIA 608, and it takes the timestamps and the hex values that that filter provides, and then it structures them into SCC. If you run the script with the dash S option, the script will then uh, send the file that it just generated back through FFmpeg and ask it to translate the SCC into an SRT. Um, I guess somewhere within FFmpeg lives this uh, lookup table. I'd actually like Carl or someone to help explain this part to me, if possible. Um, so here you can see uh, a clip from Whoopi Goldberg's Jumpin' Jack Flash. Um, at the bottom here, we have the timestamp 9137, I learned, actually is the hex representation of the musical note. And here you can see playback in FF Play uh, with the musical notes at the beginning and end of Jumpin' Jack Flash. It's a guess, guess, guess. Um, for me, the extra special, uh, totally no big deal, but I love it so very much, bonus that SCCU provides is code that you can use to preview your video with the captions overlaid in FF Play in two different ways. A kind of standard playback with captions, boring, and a zoomed in, flipped, cropped, tiled scrolling view of the actual lines of video that contain the caption information with the overlay in place. And that's on the right there, if it wasn't obvious. And I think what I love so much about this is that one, it makes for a very cool looking video, uh, but two, and definitely more importantly, it's yet another example of FFmpeg, like QC tools, teaching and showing me something about digital video that I'd never quite experienced in that way before. FFmpeg is just a remarkable tool, and even these snippets of code, uh, which might be old hat to some of you, or it can be powerfully illuminating for those of us who don't have quite as strong a grasp on the underlying complexities. And this form of visualization can also serve as a good segue into one of the last things that I'm gonna talk about, trash captions. I'm running low on time, uh, and I'll have to keep it relatively brief, but bottom line, there are a lot of bad captions out there. Why and how are very large questions that honestly I don't have all of the answers to. What I do know is that video is all about synchronization and timing, and if these things are off, they'll affect everything, and that includes captions. Uh, this EMEA L post, which I'm sure no one can read in this room, but check it out later when the slides are available. Uh, it has a message from David Crossway of DC Video that hints at some of the potential issues here. Uh, it could be a problem at the source. It could be a problem that's occurred during dubbing. It could be a problem that's occurring with your VCR as you're playing back a tape. And working with large-scale vendors, we often get metadata notes, signal notes, that say something like information on line 21, uh, but no CC. And this is one of those areas in which we just have to place our faith in our vendors um, and trust that they did what they could to ensure, uh, to recover any usable information. If you're transferring your own tapes, though, and you're still unsure of how to proceed, my best advice would be, one, get a waveform monitor, uh, as David Crossway advises, and use the line select feature to study the vertical blanking interval for the presence of captions. Or two, maybe the easier option, uh, have a calibrated professional CRT monitor as part of your signal chain. Uh, in my experience, if a CRT's decoder can't uh, interpret your captions, you probably won't have too much luck elsewhere. But again, though, what I love about this tool is that it taught me how to use FFmpeg and FFplay to examine these things on a deeper level in the digital realm. And here you can see how wildly off, and sometimes inadvertently how wildly beautiful, uh, trash captions can be. It's pretty clear to the naked eye that the time needed to clean up some of this uh, would likely just be better spent recaptioning the video in question. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, what's next for SCCU? There's nothing specific on the docket, but I do have a few ideas that just kind of came to mind. Uh, I'd love to see incorporation into vRecord. Um, that's something that I think could happen relatively easily. Um, Annie mentioned multiple caption tracks, uh, odds and evens split between English and another language. I need an example of this to actually run it through SCCU to see what the results would be. Uh, I think we could probably get there uh, if we have good test files. Um, more refinement of testing for the presence of captions by SCCU. Right now, it just scans the first 20 seconds of the video, which 
we determined pretty quickly wasn't the best me method. And we've talked about uh, testing in the beginning, middle, and end of the video. Um, and this one's kind of outside SCCU proper, but I think we could all benefit from developing quality control procedures for when we either receive or create captions for ourselves. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, there could be some way that we could better report on trash captions, something like, you're shit out of luck or it's not gonna happen. Um, so with that, uh, I'll thank you all for listening and uh, open it up to questions. Thanks, Annie. Thank you, everyone, too. Thank you. Uh, we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, David Pluger. Are closed captions and subtitles the same? Um, closed captions and subtitles are not technically the same. Um, subtitles often will involve, um, although closed captions sometimes get into this a little bit, subtitles are typically interpreting the speech a lot more, um, and they're not as verbatim as closed captions are intended to be. Closed captions also include audio effects and other things that someone who can't hear would have to understand, whereas subtitles really only represent the spoken dialogue, but, so. But technically, they're in the same place in the signal. Oh, 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 as in like a technical sense. I don't know enough about subtitles specifically to, to speak to the technical or side of would, them. Or how is it in PAL? Video is it in the same yeah. place or teletext, you know which would be that maybe Stephen could even jump in. It's, it's okay, yeah, please, please do. Um, so we have off air recordings from UK PAL television in the in the realms of hundreds of thousands of tapes, and we're we're in the process of building or R and Ding a teletext extraction workflow, and the the teletext is more complex than just mm -hmm. captions, but essentially the teletext has a subtitles component in the data. Um, and my thinking is that it, it could be a sponsorship for Paul or another developer to, to in, attempt to repeat the closed captions for US television, for, for PAL source. So I probably will get in touch with Paul and see if that's feasible um, because it's a major source of accessibility and discovery metadata, of course, and, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of it in our collection and I bet there's other European television archives who have a lot of it, so yeah, it's very exciting, and maybe I can copy it for PAL. Perhaps. Yeah, do it. Uh, I might have missed it, but I was curious, like, how you were making any of this extracted capturing data accessible to the public, like, if the SECs were like integrated into YouTube or your other media players, and I was just wondering what NYPL's policy was as far as making uh, archival video accessible to the public now, like if you are doing that uncaptioned or if you have any requirements to make content accessible even if it wasn't necessarily originally accessible? There are um, legal requirements, of course, and I think right now it's only things that are going up on our website that have to be captioned. And we have a master service agreement with a caption captioning company that will provide those services for us. In terms of things like this, historical videotapes, right now we're still in that kind of phase of digitizing, extraction, re-embedding into MP4s, which we should have provided code for, but it's on FF Improviser if you want. Um, and then hopefully those files, once they're made available, will have captions. But it's still very much a work in progress, I would say. I think we have time for one more, if anybody else has one last question. No? Okay, thank you very much.